Well, I'm glad you're If you need a handout tonight, raise your hand. The ushers have them in the back. If you need one, keep your hand up. A handout tonight. <clears throat> I'm going to keep it up there. I'll bring you one. It should be in the prayer bulletin. So if you've got a prayer bulletin, then you've probably got a handout as well. If you have your Bibles, if you would, open and find Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. We'll kind of begin there as we continue on a uh, 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 particular series that I started last year. And so I've been at it over uh, through one year already. Now this is the second year, 2019-2020. Not a whole year of time, but a whole year on the calendar. And uh, that series was called Why I Believe What I Believe or What I Believe or Why I Studied the Bible. We looked at that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Dealt with a few concepts from that particular passage. My challenge as a pastor to you as a fellow Christian is I hope, the challenge is I hope that you apply yourself diligently to God's word. All right? And that conversely, it's applied in your heart as well. All right? We should not handle the Word of God loosely. We should not handle it and treat it lightly. This is the, the written Word of God, All right, the creator of the universe, the one who sent his son to die for us, and this is not something to be, to be treated lightly. All right? This is not something that, hey, I just throw, throw around or, or even just throw open every once in a while for a quick pick-me-up. This is something that the Bible commands me to really study. And with that, I want to study some specific different topics and I kind of laid the groundwork last year. Kind of refreshes on that. This is not yet to your notes. Just kind of refreshes. If you remember, it, 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 and I'll go over with us, that we want to rule our life based on basically three guiding ideas. The first one was principles. Those are commands or things explicitly taught in God's word. Those are principles from God's word. All right? We want to live our life on that. There are things throughout God's word, throughout the whole scripture, you'll find things like how to treat someone who's unkind to you. The Bible talks about that and is very explicit about that. Well, how should we speak to our children, to our spouse? The Bible talks about that. Should I steal from my boss at work? Well, the Bible talks about that. All right? Should I murder the guy I'm angry at? We're too, it's not rhetorical. Is there an answer to that? The answer is no, just make sure you're still awake, all right? Because the Bible talks about that. Uh, and, and so we, we, first of all, look at what the Bible explicitly states. We'll look at tonight, there are commands, teachings, and examples. Commands, thou shalt, thou shalt not. This do ye, this do, don't do this. Those are commands. Then there are teachings, explanations. The, the, the truth of the Holy Spirit is a teaching, there's commands associated with it, but the Bible teaches us about the Holy Spirit so we can use it appropriately. And then there's examples in the Bible, and the Bible's full of those. Good examples and bad examples. People who followed God and reaped the benefit, those who chose to do it their own way and reap the consequences. In these, three, uh, in these three delineations of principles, we need to know what they are so we can apply them correctly. We would not want to take an example, a negative example, and apply it positively to our lives, right? To, to be way out there in left field. When Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, an example of letting Satan rule your heart. Why has Satan filled thine heart, right? We would not want to say, well, that's what I should do. I want to be a Judas. It makes obvious sense, correct? Uh, conversely, King David, when he was able to slay Goliath, there's some truths that we can grab for our life from that. All right, so examples, we want to be sure we're handling them correctly. That's why that verse, Paul to Timothy says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Make sure we do it correctly. There's principles. Then there's number two, convictions. Convictions are things, they're ideas and uh, uh, influences that the Holy Spirit has on my life. How does he have it on my life? Well, as I walk in the Spirit. As I'm filled, controlled by the Spirit. As the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, speaks to me about God, He'll bring to my life convictions. Sometimes, the Bible teaches us, He convicts us of sin. Where the Holy Spirit touches your heart and says, that right there where you said that was sin. You are a first class jerk. Being a jerk is not a good Christian. Conviction. Sometimes it's in a sermon, and, and then the application, the Holy Spirit will say, that's talking to you right there. And, and uh, other times it's through someone else, other friends. Sometimes it's through the Scripture you're reading the Bible, and God says, right there, fix your attitude. That doesn't please me. It can conviction. 
He'll also guide us into all truth. So there could be convictions to help us walk this path, this path where the Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God about God. In fact, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself, but will speak of him who, who speaketh to him. All right, so that's conviction. And then there's standards. This is the last section. There's principles, conviction, and standards. Standards are, are decisions that we make based upon principles and convictions to help us please the Lord or not violate those convictions or principles. All right, so a principle may be, I don't want to murder anybody. It's a wonderful principle to follow, one we all ought to follow, especially if you don't like me, please follow that one for sure. All right, now, even though I don't want to murder somebody, I decide under conviction of the Holy Spirit that it's probably not in God's economy a good idea to become angry at people. All right? Because typically murder happens when you're angry. Murder is a passion crime. All right? So then as a standard, I may say, then I will never, I will never have undealt with conflict with people in my heart. All right? Now, can I, can I have conflict in my heart and not be guilty of murder? Well, absolutely. Right. But if I am having this standard that helps me keep these things over here. Be careful, though. Standards are not the end all. That's where people get in trouble. Where they say, my standard of, of my hair being this long or, or this short or, or this or that, that's what God says. No, no. Principles are what God says. These things can never be violated. All right? Adultery will never be okay. No matter how you cut it, slice it, or dice it, it's not okay. All right? That's principles. So that's where we're backing with. So tonight, I want to now deal with this idea of music and the Christian. I cannot think of too many topics that are more controversial than music and Christians. All right? Everyone, it seems, every Christian has an idea of what music ought to look like personally and corporately inside of a church. Right? There are publications and articles and blogs dedicated, dedicated to exposing other Christians' corrupt music. Corrupt in their eyes. Please do not waste your time and search for these things because they are a waste of your time. All right? You'll find that there'll be a small church with five members in the middle of nowhere and it seems like some guy's got a blog. Let me tell you why. They're on a slippery slope of compromise. They sang a song by filling an artist. And now they're on a straight path to where the devil lives. There's these blocks. Waste of time. And I cannot think of too many more topics that are more t controversial, have been more controversial than music and Christians. And so I like to, with the Lord's help, over the next few weeks months, years, talk about music. And from there, some other topics uh, that I believe the Lord have us to deal with. Um, some of those other topics uh, are entertainment, alcohol, women, and the role in the church. That's a hot one out, not in our church, out there right now. And uh, what does God say about that? Some topics like that that I hope will be a blessing. And how I want to approach them is this way. I want to approach it, first of all, from God's Word. That's where we will begin. Okay, we'll begin in God's Word, and isn't that a good place to begin? I will, now, tonight I'll begin with actually some misconceptions and then the foundation of, of God's Word. I won't even define music tonight. All right, we'll get to that. I'm just going to, we're going to walk through God's Word. All right, and then from there, hopefully, from the principles, be able to, uh, be able to identify some potential convictions and then some standards that could be helpful. That's how I'm going to approach it. I hope, and I gave you almost all the notes, there's some blanks. There's, there's a big debate, First Baptist Church, if you should have blanks or not. Right? Some of you are anti-blankers. You don't want to fill in blanks, and, and they distract you. Other of you are wholehearted blankers. All right? Because you like the interaction. Tonight, the anti-blankers, or, or the blankers, win. All right, maybe next week there'll be anti-blankers. I don't know. But I, I, gave you the, I gave you a lot of scripture in that, past, in that sheet tonight as well. I encourage you, I implore you, I hope that you go home and look at it again, the scripture. All right, look it up for yourself. 
Find out if what I'm telling you is actually true. Now, I believe it to be true. I've tried to put my time in studying, but I have no problem you going and saying, and come back saying, Pastor Howell, you said that this meant this, and I'm studying it, 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 why doesn't it mean this instead? That does not bother me at all. I am not afraid of truth, nor am I ever, ever, ever above error. All right, I, I'm not trying to bring error, right? But I couldn't misspeak, could I not? And I hope you as a Christian, don't just take my word for it. Don't be one of those Christians. You almost say, no, this is what God says. Absolutely. All right? I think you'll find what I'm saying is truth. Truth can defend itself I've said it before, I'll say it again. How do you defend a lion? You don't have to. You just let it go. That's truth. You don't have to defend truth, just let it go. God's word and truth will not return void. So let's ask God something. I already prayed, I don't think I prayed yet. I gave you all background. Let me pray. We'll get into this tonight and go as far as we can. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for this time we have as a church, Lord, and then just really study your word and look at some things that, Lord, could be potentially controversial or that could be even uh, uh, argumentative at times in our spirit. I pray that our spirit would be open to your spirit, that your word would speak to us through your truth and touch us, change us. Lord, may we walk according to your word and your will and your way. Lord, may we have a mind that's open to you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. So there's some problems with music. Some problems with music is, is uh, number one, that music gets into your soul down into your soul, down into the depths of the innermost parts of your being, actually we'll find later on found in Scripture, all the way down. Music is different than clothing. Clothing does not get into your soul. Music makes, it way, makes its way all the way in there. You can, you can uh, have music and you can have maybe listened to a song years earlier, Walk into an establishment, hear three notes of that song, and what will happen? Help me. What will happen? The whole thing comes back. But more than that comes back, proven. More than that comes back, usually an emotional response to that song comes back as well. Documented, people will feel happy or sad based on that song, not even realizing what is taking place, but, but what will have happened, they tell me, is that because of an experience, maybe the first time you heard this song, you're at a, a funeral, or there was some joyous occasion, and because of that, you associate this song with these feelings of emotion that when you hear that song, touch you in such a way that there's even a chemical reaction that happens. That's what music does. Songs get stuck in your head, Right? Jingle bells, jingle bells. You know what happens in your mind? You finish it, jingle all the way. Why? Because that's what happens to us with music. Music gets into our soul. This is not something that we as a Christian should tread lightly upon. All right, because if, if truly music is that powerful, if it truly does touch us on an emotional and a spiritual and a knowledge level, if it touches on those levels, then it's not something that we should say, hey, whatever is okay, or whatever happens, happens. We should not be so careless if music is, tru is truly that powerful. The other problem that I see with music is, as Christians, how we deal with it can become very pious and pharisaical. I mentioned this about a year and a half ago, but often when we talk about music, we talk about it this way. Things that are left and things that are right. My right and my left, yours would be reversed. Does not matter because when I talk about left and right, it's always in regards to me, not to anyone else. We say things like this about music. Well, that church, they've gone pretty left in their music. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that church, that institution, that religious place now has done some things that are just way out in left field with music. Maybe they've got some instruments on the stage that we know have no place in church. And what we mean by that, what we're implying by that, I should say, is that they've gone so far left that there's no way that God could be over there. God can't be a part of darkness. There's no gray with God. And that's left well, they're out of control over there. 
And then we say this, well, there's those places over there, they're way right of us. The churches that don't believe you should use any instruments in a service. At all, period. Piano, organ, nothing. Just a human vocal cords. Say, wow, wow. They are way too strict about that stuff. They are way right. What are we saying by that? Well, there's no way that God could be found in something so strict over there. And what we have now put ourselves up to be is the only place that God can dwell. God can't be over there because they're way too conservative, and God's definitely not over there. They're way too wild. Thankfully, God sits right with me because I'm right in the middle. And whatever I do at church or whatever I listen to, God is right here with me. What a pious and pharisaical attitude. You know, it, it's, it's unbelievably pious and pharisaical to think that God can only be right with me. All right? I want to be right with God. Now, could there be, could there be songs that do not please the Lord? Absolutely. And could there be songs over here that are so, if I can, liturgical that God would not be part of this? Yeah, you ever heard monks? Right? Those are songs. All right, is God in rote? Well, not necessarily. So there could be those extremes. All right, but the problem I see that I've observed with music is that it, it, it seems often that when Christians talk about it, they're always compare, comparing it back to themselves. And that's the first mis, mis, misconception. The first misconception is the greatest determining factor is me. I like this song. I don't like that song. That song doesn't offend me, and boy, I can't listen to that song. All of a sudden, I've now become the authority on music. And if I read my Bible correctly, I ought to have God be the authority, and I just find out where he's at and be there. So the first misconception is the greatest determining factor is me, which cannot be the case. If you and I become the greatest determining factor in music, then we will absolutely choose the wrong type of music. Because even as Paul said, that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So if it's up to me, then my flesh will take over. All right, This is true for all of us as Christians. If we are left to our own devices, we will be ruled by our flesh, which is always which always result in corruption but if i find another path i can lead the life everlasting now number two the other the second misconception is this music is often the factor by which we judge a ministry a church may have music that we would not play here at first baptist church and if you're not careful you're like well that church or that church that music is just is just nuts not even considering their use of the Bible, preaching, soul winning, outreach, evangelism, kindness, love for others. It's like a, oh, like a soul litmus test in music. In fact, someone once said, you show me a church and their music and I'll show you the, the direction of that church. The problem is not true. It could be a factor, but it's not the sole factor. Number, number three misconception is this, that music doesn't matter. All things are lawful to me, and all things, but all things are not expedient. Who cares what I listen to in my car? God. He cares all the time. What do we do? And in that, we'll construct this house, this two-level house, if we're not careful. And in this two-level house, we're not careful, we'll say that there's a secular and there's a sacred. And so at church, God cares about what I do, but once I step outside of church, then my life is really a secular look, and so it doesn't really matter what I do or how the Bible affects my life. But at church, it matters, but everywhere else, it doesn't matter. The fact is, once we're a Christian, all right, Christianity affects all of my life. There's not a two-level house where there's salvation and then everything else in church and at home. It's all the time I'm a Christian. I'm, a save. I'm saved. I've been bought with a price. And so music does matter, and it matters all of the time. The last, I want to say this before we get started, that this particular topic, what I give you, is, will not be all-inclusive. There's no way you can read one book, all right, one lesson, and somehow handle every single situation. I'm hoping to give you some principles 
some broad stripes as we uh, look tonight. I'd like to look at, first of all, then the prin- some principles of music. And in that, remember, there are commands, teachings, and examples. And then I want to start with some commands that we find in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, you have your Bibles there. It's also on your paper. Paul is writing, is writing to the church at Ephesus, a church that I believe he has planted. And Ephesians chapter 5 is most often known for its, its, uh, its instruction in marriage. All right, ladies, you've probably heard of verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 5. It says, wives, submit yourselves. You've heard of that verse. That's where Ephesians 5 normally we go to. And, and men, you're supposed to love your wives as your own bodies. That's verse 28. And I taught on this last year, but I believe Ephesians chapter 5, the context of it is you're a Christian, you're saved from light, all right, or by the light, so walk in the light. Act like it. And then he goes through all these scenarios. Inside of that context... All right, we see verses 18 and 19, where he says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We will, Lord willing, get to alcohol. Not tonight, though. He continues that phrase, though, which we know that verse, but be filled with the Spirit. He continues that thought in verse number 19, and now deals with some music. He says, Speaking to yourselves, there's the beginning of the command, Speaking to yourselves, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The first command I want to deal with is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. I want to kind of break apart this verse for us and understand what Paul, I believe, from the truth he's trying to communicate. The first thing he says is this, speaking to yourselves. Now, in the uh, construction of the speaking to yourselves, he, is, he does not mean talk just to yourself. Right? He's not saying just sing to yourself, just speak to yourself, like go on your own little private area. That's not the context or construction of that particular phrase. That phrase construction literally means speaking among yourselves. The yourselves, the, the, uh, the selectiveness is not singular, but plural, but corporately plural among Christians of the church he's talking to. So he's not saying to individuals, speak to yourself, but as a church, he goes, now speaking to yourselves. So church family, that says, as you speak to yourselves, this is what it looks like in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He uses these three words to describe these type of songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. I once heard a definition about these three, these three words that, that at that time I was young, and, and I thought, well, that's interesting. They said, well, Psalms are from the book of Psalms or other place in the Bible, and, and there are books that have put all the Psalms to music. They're called Psalters. And there are churches that will, that will sing through the actual Psalms found in the book of Psalms. And, and how it works is you have this Psalm, and then you have different tunes. And you say, well, turn to Psalm you know, 23 and turn to tune 12 and you combine these two things and then you can sing through the Psalms. The, uh, uh, we'll look later on, but the word Psalms is actually found in the book of Psalms. The word Psalms means this either from Psalms or in the book of Psalms, songs with instruments and music. With instruments. In the definition. He says, speaking with psalms, and then he says with hymns. And this particular person went on to say that now hymns, those are songs like holy, holy, holy. Now the problem is, when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, holy, 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 all right, the melody as we know it, the song as we know it, all right, was not penned. I don't think Paul was looking ahead about two, uh, about uh, 1,800 years, and thinking of holy, holy, holy. And then they went on to say this, well, spiritual songs, that's like songs like victory in Jesus. Now I know Paul was not looking ahead to victory in Jesus, and I love victory in Jesus. All right, I, I love that song. But when I heard that definition of these words, it seemed a touch shallow, so upon studying this, I think I'm going to give a little more depth. Psalms, meaning songs 
either from the book of Psalms or songs accompanied by instruments. Hymns are literally, in explanation, extemporaneous expressions of praise. Something that happens kind of naturally. In fact, I found a passage where this took place in Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And it, the Bible says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. They sit there in jail. They begin to sing. By definition, the Bible says that's hymns right there. You ever done this before? Maybe not to a melody or assume you're driving down the road like, Lord, thank you for this, thank you for this, thank you for this, thank you for this, thank you. You're just a great God. You ever done that before? It's praise. Not planned, not something you read or something else penned down, a poem. You just start to just praise just on the moment right then. Boom, it's just start going. And, and you're going and you're like, man, God, aren't you good? Aren't you great? This is great. My wife had a phenomenal idea last year. We have a blessing jar at the house. If you don't have a blessing jar, I'd encourage you to get a place where you can put down blessings and a little jar and a little paper next to it. We can write down blessings. And end of the year, this last year, we went back and, and looked over a lot of the blessings. Then my favorites were my daughter Danielle, and her little blessings and her scraggly little handwriting, things she's thankful for, you know, for my father and uh, my dad, you know, I mean, good, wonderful blessings, obviously just, you know, powerful blessings. Thank you, Brother Jill, thank you. But basically the hymns, they sang out of their heart. To God, what was going on here came out. See, sometimes as Christians, what's going on here gets gets locked up here. Like, I'm happy on the inside. No, no, no. God says, and Paul says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and this extemporaneous expressions and spiritual songs. Now, this is cool. This is cool. Spiritual songs. All right, well, what's a spiritual song? Well, by definition, by definition, a spiritual song is opposite of that which is carnal opposite of that which is carnal so that tells me that my spiritual songs ought to be opposite of that which i was saved from well that'll preach right there that'll preach right there that that there are some things here that are opposite of what's supposed to happen over here what happens over here the bible calls them <laughs> spiritual songs spirit led a holy spirit involved the songs that means, that tells me, understanding the Bible, that there are some songs that God is not in. Because they're carnal, they're earthly, they're fleshly. And there are songs that he gets involved in. When he gets involved, boy, you're touched. You're like, wow, something happened here. And that's thing I notice in this one, it's bold in your notes. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He is the recipient of this music, or music. Found in your heart, right to him. Now, notice that he combines speaking to yourselves and in your heart. It's a, it's a two-fold idea. It's almost uh, um, like, a, like a paradox or, 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 or a problem there. Like, am I singing it in my heart or am I singing it to the Lord and the answer, or, or to, to others? The answer is yes. You're doing both. Like I've challenged us here at First Baptist Church, when we sing, we sing here. All right? But others are influenced here. That's why I think the principle is our corporate music. The principle, our corporate music influences others but is directed toward God. So Mrs. Mitchell Stanton sings, thought it would be directed right here. Will that influence others? It's supposed to. It's supposed to. We'll look at that more in the next passage. I put down underneath there, if you think I'm off in left field, other supporting scripture. Psalm chapter 71, verse 23. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee. Right there. And my soul which thou hast redeemed. Psalm 100. 100 verses 1 and 2, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing, with singing. Psalms makes up 7% of the Bible, 7% is found in the book of Psalms, or what I found, I should say, I did not count all the words, I trusted the scholar for that number right there, okay? 
7% of, of the Bible, they say, is, is, is found in the book of Psalms. It was a, an entire song book. Music important to God? You better believe it. The Bible has more references to music, you're talking about music at 7%, than heaven and hell. I'm not saying music is more important than heaven and hell, I'm just saying the Bible spends that much time with music. It's important to God. Another passage, if you want to turn there, or in your notes, Colossians 3, verses 15 and 16. Paul, again the writer, you'll find a similarity between Ephesians, where he says, verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and to be ye thankful. So when he says we're called in one body, he's now referring, to this, referring again to this corporate idea of a, of a church or the body of Christ, all right, that we're this unit as Christians, all right, not just singular as individuals, we're a unit now. And then he goes right into verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That let, that's the command, that's what's in the command section. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now this is interesting. Because where he goes next, obviously, is to music. But he begins this command with saying, let this word of Christ, let, 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 let God's word dwell in you richly. Let it be fluent in your life. Oh, let it have a huge effect. Be overrun with this word of Christ, all right? Richly in all wisdom. You have to say, okay, well, where does that lead in someone's life? Well, where does it lead? If he's going to let this word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, what's the result of that? That's what's amazing. Teaching and admonishing one another. How? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The result of the word of God dwelling richly, the word of Christ dwelling in me richly in all wisdom, being affluent in my life, equals singing with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And he, just in case you miss it, says singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The basis for the songs, the basis for the singing in my heart is the word of Christ dwelling richly inside of me. I teach and I caution. That's that admonish. I warn through music. And I'm supposed to sing with grace and gratitude in my heart again to the Lord. What's the principle? Our music should flow from a knowledge of Christ and a sense of of gratitude. You ever find yourself in a blessed state, in a happy, joyful state, and you're whistling? Humming a song? Just going along there, just singing. Why? Because you're so happy. You're joyful. There's gratefulness. Why are you so happy? Eh, it's what God's done for me. Our music will influence others. And then top it off, James, in James chapter 5, verse 13, says this, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Amen. I know a song. If you're happy and you know it, sing. That's what James says. If you're merry. All right. Let me define merry for you. You ready? This is deep. I know, I know. I went to school for that right there. <laughs> among you. That's where he starts there in the in, in, uh, beginning of the verse. Is any among you? He wrote the book of James to the brethren, which are scattered abroad, greeting. James chapter 1. He's writing to Christians. So he said, listen, if you're a Christian and you're merry, let him sing psalms. Uh, interesting command again. If you're happy, write a letter. Do that. But he says, sing about it. Principle? One expression of our joy is to sing. So if you're happy at church, what should you do? Sing. The minute you say, well, I don't have a very good voice, you've now missed the point of Ephesians 5 and Colossians because you're not making melody to other people. You're making melody to Him. It's to the Lord. So the commands, I think, are clear from Scripture. There's some other ones not all inclusive, let me give you just one other principle tonight, and that's some of the teaching here, where Psalm 95 says this, because I love this point, and, this, and then we'll end with this section tonight. Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and make 
That same phrase found in verse number one, a joyful noise unto him with psalms. There's that word psalms found in the book of Psalms. All right, so psalms can be talking about psalms because psalms hadn't been there yet. Psalms, all right? So it's, it's about some instruments. Verse 3, for the, Lord our God, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. I'm going to give you just a couple concepts from this, or just one big concept from this verse. It says, let us make, verse number 1 and verse number 2, a, quote, joyful noise. See it? Put it in bold for so you wouldn't miss it tonight. You see a joyful noise. What is a joyful noise? Some would say, well, that's when your voice sounds nice. That's a joyful noise. All right, and the truth is we like nicer sounding voices better than, than worse sounding voices. Some will, say, some will say, well, a joyful noise is when everything just fits together so beautifully and, and the choir and the orchestra and the piano and the organ. And, and we, I'm, we are blessed to have excellent musicians here at First Baptist Church. All right, but, but that's not what in this passage a joyful noise means. In this passage, a joyful mo- noise means to shout and lift up your voice. It means a loud noise. Same word is found in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 5. I don't know if I put this verse in your notes. Did I put this one in there? Good. Look at it. The word that's bold is the same word, joyful noise. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted, that's not the word, with a great shout. That's the word, joyful noise. So that the earth rang again. But don't miss what he's saying. He said they shouted, and in case you missed it, with a great shout, and in case you missed it again, so the whole earth rang. So that any person could figure out exactly what happened here. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, there they, where they viewed the presence of God to be, that's why they're excited, came into the camp. They got excited. Better than any football game, NASCAR race, or basketball game. And they begin to shout, right? Is that, am I, you see it right there? I'm not making this up, am I? Well, it's right there, isn't it? So much that the earth rang again. What does that mean, earth rang again? I don't know, but I know what the effect sounds like. Like a big boom, like a big, like, whoa, the whole place is shaking, right? That's what it means. It wasn't quiet. Jesus loves me, this I know. That's not Psalm 95, folks. Sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise. Some psalms, a song with instrumental music, some worship. I like verse 6, let us worship and bow down. See, the point of this whole joyful noise was not that, that we're just creating a big rigmarole. I told you years ago about a, about a church I was familiar with, and and they were a church in the southern part of the, the U.S., and, and they do things a little bit differently down this church. And when people got excited, they'd do crazy things like take a lap around a church, grab a potted plant, and run with it. Okay, now that's fine if they're, they're expressions, but that does not equal necessarily a joyful noise. He says, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. The result of all this is that we're humbled by it. Principle there, our music should be expressive and reverent. I'm going to have to stop for tonight, but I'm just getting warmed up inside of this thing. The Bible talks about music, and it becomes very descriptive about music. I believe if we let it, it'll change how we approach music, definitely at church. If we start to sing with a joyful noise in church, not caring about this, but caring about this, right? we will raise the roof at First Baptist Church. And it's contagious. It's catching. It's different. People walk away like, wow, what happened there? That was great. And it wasn't a facade or fake. That's where we started. Because it's in our hearts to the Lord. Lord, I thank you for your word. We're just starting now to 
look at what you said about music, Lord. I pray you'd give us the grace and strength to look at your word with an open mind. Lord, give us the wisdom that we so desperately need. Lord, help us to crave it. Lord, guide us and Lord, we'll do our best to follow you. In Jesus' name.